Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce today Aneta Dimitrova, who is Associate Professor for Ultra Slavonic at Sofia University, St. Clement um, Ochritsky, since 2008. She completed her PhD in 2007 with a thesis on the Slavonic translations uh, of the Presla Vitae of St. Anthony the Great and others, including John Chrysostom, and had since held visiting positions in Regensburg and extended ones in uh, Vienna. She has published broadly on Slavonic literature and particularly on translations from Greek to Slavonic. And today we get to hear her uh, talk about her work on the two Slavonic translations of Chrysostom's homilies on the Statues and their Greek sources. Aneta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, first to thank Dan for this invitation. Um, I'm very excited to share with you my work on these particular homilies because I've been working uh, on them for a short time, but I'm planning to work some more. So uh, I will be very thrilled to, to hear what you will have to say. Uh, maybe we can start. Um, I have some um, some examples, of course, on uh, in Old Church Slavonic, but I'll I, I try to um, translate them in English or to make them as uh, technical as uh, as uh, not technical as possible. Um, and uh, I've made a small uh, schedule of my talk today. Um, I'll try to uh, say something about uh, the. Um, the most important and the earliest translations of the homilies uh, on the statues in Old Church Slavonic, uh, but especially I will focus on uh, the complete ones. So uh, I'll say several uh, words about uh, these homilies, but I'm sure that you are familiar because they are a very famous work. And then uh, I'll uh, Say something also about uh, the complete translations, first uh, the earliest ones and then uh, the later one. Uh, I'll give some examples how the two complete translations are different, but you'll see that at the same time they are also the same uh, in some ways, and I'll try to uh, draw some conclusions. So the homilies on the statues are uh, a very famous work of John Chrysostom and uh, one of the earliest uh, where he could prove how good a uh, rhetorician he is. Uh, they include usually in the manuscripts 21 or 22 families, but uh, some say that there are uh, 24 altogether. Uh, they were pronounced in uh, the old church of Antioch during Lent of 387. And uh, they had a particular historical context. So when the citizens of Antioch rioted against some new taxes that were imposed by uh, Emperor Theodosius, uh, they broke images and uh, the statues of the emperor and, and his family. They were very frightened. Uh, and the bishop went to Constantinople to pray or to beg the emperor for mercy, uh, whereas John Chrysostom, as a young preacher, stayed in Antioch and uh, tried to calm down the population, uh, pronouncing these very, very interesting uh, homilies. So according to uh, Clavis Patrum Grecorum, apart from the Old Church Slavonic translations, there is an Armenian translation of the homilies and homily one is found also in Syriac and Latin. I suppose that there are also other um, other witnesses of these texts, but uh, I haven't worked with other traditions. Uh, there are many, many Greek manuscripts not critically studied, and the best edition that we have uh, for now is the Patrologia Greca edition. So these homilies had a good representation in the uh, medieval Slavonic world. Here, I'll, uh, I'm just showing you, and I'll just mention 
the first one, uh, this is a partial translation. Uh, this is only a selection of sentences. Uh, it is a part of a floor religion. Uh, it is quite well known that uh, it was made in the first quarter of the 10th century uh, in Preslav, the medieval uh, capital of Bulgaria. And uh, here you can see some of the earliest copies. I will not uh, say anything more about this selection, only that uh, it is not entirely clear uh, whether this selection was made from the Greek text and uh, translated only partially into Old Church Slavonic or whether uh, a complete translation existed and uh, the uh, sentences were extracted from there. But uh, we know now, or we can uh, uh, affirm that uh, such a translation at this time, a complete translation of the homilies on the statues, existed. And uh, here comes the first complete translation of these homilies into Old Church Slavonic. Uh, I will refer to it as P, or Preslav uh, translation. It is uh, it uh, it is of uh, the homilies one to twenty one, so twenty one homilies, which excludes the so called uh, homily number twenty. Uh, the numbers are according to the edition in Patrologia Greca, and uh, presumably it was made in uh, again in the tenth uh, century in Presla. Uh, we have some. Um, evidence about it, and I will talk about it uh, in a minute. But uh, the earliest copies, uh, as it often happens, are not South Slavic. They are not uh, even uh, um, earlier than the 16th century. Uh, this translation is known from at least 15 copies, which are Russian and date from the earliest one is from the end of the 16th century. Something about these copies, uh, here you see uh, one of the um, pages of such a manuscript, but um, I've compared uh, at least three of them uh, and I have access to maybe five out of these 15. And uh, these three are very, very uh, similar, uh, maybe written in the same scriptorium, maybe even uh, by the same scribe or at least two of them. So it looks like uh, this tradition started or was revived at some point in uh, Russia in the uh, 16th century. But as we will see, there are also some uh, traces that uh, the uh, translation was made much earlier and uh, it had some, um, some transmission uh, also in Bulgaria or in the uh, South Slavic uh, world. So what is the evidence that uh, makes us argue that uh, this Preslav translation was made in the 10th century? Because we don't have copies from then uh, and from uh, Bulgaria. But usually, if we want to ascribe a, a translation to the Preslav period, which means to the first Bulgarian kingdom, not later than uh, the end of the 10th century or the beginning of the 11th, uh, usually we look at the language and the linguistic evidence. Uh, here, I will not read much, but there are usually um, words and some some uh, parts of the grammar that are typical of the translations uh, from the Preslav uh, era. And uh, there are lists of uh, words that uh, are usually uh, used in such other works also translated or not translated that are of uh, indisputable uh, Preslav origin. Here, um, on, uh, also um, the Russian um, scholars, Gorsky and Nevostruev, in the mid 19th century, gave a very, very large list of such words from this particular translation of the homilies on the statues. So it was known since the 19th century that this uh, translation is very archaic compared to the manuscripts that it, is, uh, it was preserved in. 
And here uh, I gave several words that uh, are typical typical of the uh, manuscripts uh, of the texts of uh, Preslav origin. Um, some of these words are from uh, Proto-Bulgarian origin and uh, others are of uh, Vulcan Latin origin. Uh, many of them are of very uh, limited use. For example, they are not used outside of such texts or uh, they are not used later. Usually for these notions, there are uh, synonyms. So we have uh, an abundant uh, material about, about the uh, archaic nature of this translation. The second um, piece of evidence that uh, these Russian copies are uh, maybe the beginning of new transmission history, but they have some long transmission history before that, is that uh, there are also uh, already some mistakes, scribal errors, uh, which were due to misunderstanding and uh, presumably there were many, many uh, generations of uh, transcription and these mistakes were piling up. Here I chose uh, only three, but there are may maybe dozens. I'll read some of them um, because there are a few. For example, in all the manuscripts that I've seen uh, of this translation uh, in a certain uh, context, we read dobrovolie, which means goodwill, and it doesn't make sense in uh, this context. Uh, it is instead of dobrovonie, which means good smell or fragrance. And in uh, Greek, we have eudia or miron. Um, the second part of this word dobrovonie, which is uh, the root for uh, smell or fragrance, was maybe already a little bit archaic uh, in the context of the 16th uh, century Russia. Or uh, the next example is rechenie, which means saying instead of retenie, context, uh, contest for the Greek hamila. And the uh, third one I find uh, especially interesting. Um, the context is about flowers and we have ina, which means others, instead of the Greek borrowing ia, which is the plural of eon, violet. Uh, this borrowing, so there are uh, plenty of Greek borrowings in uh, Old Church Slavonic, but this one is not uh, particularly typical. And uh, I doubted that uh, the scribes recognized the word. So they corrected it to Ina. And there are also other uh, such mistakes, scribal errors, uh, that show that the uh, these identical Russian copies were not the first stage of uh, transmission. Uh, there is also, uh, I think, uh, the most compelling evidence about uh, the uh, older time, uh, older dating of this translation are the indirect witnesses. So parts of uh, this translation of the homilies on the statues uh, are also um, part of other texts, other um, collections of homilies that are uh, indisputably uh, more archaic. And for example, the entire uh, 15 homily of the statues um, in this translation is also part of the so-called Lotus III collection. This is a collection of uh, Chrysostomian homilies. Uh, and it is known because this collection, Lotus III, has a, a, pref a preface that says that it was uh, translated and compiled uh, at uh, uh, Tsar Simeon's behest, which means the first quarter of the 10th century. And uh, uh, homily number 15 in the Preslav translation is part of this collection. It is true that, again, the earliest copy is from the 15th century, so 1474. Uh, here you can see a small uh, picture of it. But uh, it is still at least a century earlier than the first uh, complete copies uh, of the whole translation. And then uh, another uh, example is a small excerpt from Homily 5, 
which is uh, part of a floor religion, uh, which is dated uh, for sure at the beginning of the 10th century. Although the, the earliest copies that I could find of this particular um, excerpt is uh, from the 13th century. But maybe uh, we have also uh, witnesses from, uh, from the 12th or even from the 11th century. Okay. So uh, I think that uh, this is um, uh, convincing that uh, translation P is from the 10th century. And now I'll go on to the, to the other complete translation. So apart from uh, this uh, collection of 21 homilies, we have another complete translation of the homilies on the statues, which includes 22 homilies, including the uh, so-called homily number 20. Uh, here we see the most famous copy. This is uh, the manuscript from the Rila Monastery 3.6 from the year 1473. It was written by a renowned scribe, Vladislav the Grammarian, and he left uh, uh, this colophon that uh, I'm showing you here, two pages of a, a colophon, that says that uh, uh, the homilies on the statues were translated by a certain Serbian monk Antonius in the Tupedi uh, monastery on Mount Athos. Um, this translation uh, had a much more limited distribution. I'm aware of only three copies, uh, one of which I haven't seen, and the other one, I mean the third one, is a copy of this uh, that I'm showing to you. So uh, quite limited, uh, but uh, with some information about its history. The date of the translation itself is not so uh, clear because some scholars think that this monk Antonius used to be a monk in the Vatupedi um, monastery not after 1380s, so end of the uh, 14th century which means it is a century earlier than the copy of Vladislav the Grammarian. But according to other uh, scholars, this copy of Vladislav the Grammarian is first or uh, at most second generation copy. I think these uh, two uh, arguments don't contradict themselves. So uh, it is possible that uh, the translation, the second translation was made in the 14th century. Language is uh, also typical of the 14th century translations. Very, very literal, uh, much closer to Greek grammatically. I have several examples here. I'll just read the most interesting ones. For example, the Greek fere, which means come on, well, uh, in this translation is translated as prinesi, which means bring, so literally bring which may, uh, makes no sense in the context, but it's every time like that. Uh, there are several calcs, like uh, homodulos, uh, which is usually translated as uh, uh, with one word, uh, meaning fellow. Here it is uh, with a calc, edinoravn, which means enslaved together or one serfdom or something similar, uh, and so on. Uh, from the grammar, I can say that uh, what is very typical of uh, the translations of the 14th century is imitating the Greek definite article, because in Old Church Slavonic there is no definite article. One way to render that is with the relative pronoun ije. And uh, in this uh, Athenite translation, translation A, uh, the second complete translation, uh, this ije, which imitates the Greek definite article, is used even when uh, the Slavonic language uh, didn't need it. So uh, here I have several examples. I'm not uh, going to read them, uh, but it is all over uh, the whole translation. So uh, when we look at the uh, two translations, A and P, or P because it's the first one and A, which is the, the second one, uh, they look different, they use different words. Uh, usually they are synonyms, uh, but uh, the, I think the most compelling uh, 
evidence that uh, they are independent uh, is the Greek text. So um, I'll say a couple of words, although I also uh, I already mentioned that uh, the Greek text is uh, preserved in, according to Pinakes, more than two, 230 copies. But we have to be careful how we count these copies because um, many manuscripts are listed twice because uh, homily 20 is listed as a separate item. So uh, if we remove uh, even if we remove uh, these uh, repetitions uh, from the list of pinnacles or some fragments and so on of uh, separate homilies, still we, uh, there will be maybe more than hundred remaining copies uh, with this text. Unfortunately, uh, there is no critical edition, as I already said. Uh, I'm not aware uh, of a critical uh, study of this tradition, and uh, therefore I'm uh, forced to look at the manuscripts themselves. Of course, I can't, uh, and I haven't compared uh, 100 manuscripts, but I looked at uh, several. Here uh, I showed five, uh, five manuscripts from the 9th to the 11th century, although it would be interesting to see what happens in the later tradition uh, in, in the 13th, 14th century. But for now, I compared uh, these manuscripts to the Slavonic translations. And there are um, some examples that show that the discrepancies between the uh, Slavonic manuscripts, uh, the Slavonic uh, translations are uh, supported by different, sometimes by different Greek uh, versions or different Greek branches of this transmission uh, history. So, for example, um, in uh, in the first translation, in the Preslav translation, uh, where we have uh, the word holding uh, corresponding to two of the Greek manuscripts, katechusa. In the other uh, one, in the Athenite translation, we have oblivayushti, pouring. Uh, which corresponds to uh, the edition in Patrologia Greca and uh, to more Greek uh, manuscripts, Katahelsa, and so on. So we can see that uh, the omission in part of the Greek uh, manuscripts corresponds to the first translation, and uh, the missing text is present in the other translation and in part of the Greek uh, tradition. Or uh, the Greek Kakegorian. Uh, which means slander is translated uh, in the uh, in p with evil deed. Uh, so kake, the first part of the word, is translated with evil, and uh, in the second translation, it is slander. We can say that maybe it translates kategorian, uh, although it's not entirely uh, certain whether kategorian uh, is a better correspondence to. Uh, slander than Kakegurian, but anyway, we have these variants in the Greek manuscript. Uh, I will not read the, the long one, but there are also dozens, dozens of such examples. And uh, I think that uh, it is really compelling that the two Slavonic translations followed different Greek uh, manuscripts, especially having in mind that the uh, translation A uh, had this uh, homily 20 that is missing from part of the Greek uh, and uh, from the uh, Preslav translation. But having all this in mind, uh, here we have some more uh, examples. We can go back uh, in the discussion if uh, we need that. Having all this in mind, still, um, um, we can see that the two translations are not so different after all, if we read them word for word and sentence for sentence. Sometimes even, uh, even if all the words are different, the syntax is the same. Uh, even the, uh, the, some, uh, discrepancies from the Greek is the same for both, uh, translations. So here I, uh, want to give just a visual um, example, 
how clothes are sometimes the two translations uh, closer than it is possible to ascribe it to uh, mere luck or coincidence. Uh, on the top picture is translation P, so the Preslav, the 10th century one, and on the bottom is uh, the 14th century one. And uh, with red, uh, I have underlined where the two translations coincide completely, which is not possible if two independent uh, translators had uh, uh, worked on these texts uh, apart uh, from each other. And uh, with the blue, these are only uh, word order changes, but uh, here are several completely random examples of how uh, how um, alike these two translations are. So what I uh, argue, and uh, I think I can go to the conclusions and then uh, discuss it uh, further a little bit later, um, John Chrysostom's homilies on the statues uh, obviously had an abundant and at the same time restricted reception in the medieval Slavonic world. So I haven't mentioned, but there is one more complete new translation, but it is later in Russian from the 17th century, which was based again on this Preslav, on the first one, on the first translation. And we have the... Um, the original copy of the translator who uh, who just uh, uh, wrote between the lines uh, the new the new Russian translation. So uh, on the one hand, uh, we had many uh, attempts at translating this uh, Chrysostomian work, but on the other hand, uh, we don't have enough uh, traces from the earliest translation and. Uh, it was revived, so the first complete translation uh, was revived in the 16th, 17th century Russia. But uh, it left its uh, trace in the earlier sources, and uh, I argue that uh, it was the underlying text for the 14th century translation that was made on uh, Mount Athos, which indeed was based on different Greek manuscripts. Some parts were translated anew, but uh, mainly it uh, supplemented and corrected the shortcomings of the first uh, first Preslav translation. So uh, this is uh, what I wanted to share with you and I will be very interested in your comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anjata, for sharing with us this interesting exploration along the translations and transmissions of um, the Chrysostom homilies. I am sure that many in the audience here are eager to continue the conversation with you. Uh, so I'm very happy to open the floor for questions. Please, if you have questions, you can raise your virtual hand. You can also um, write questions in the chat if you are not able to speak, and we can read them out uh, for you. And perhaps um, if I could start with a brief opening uh, question. So you mentioned several times the reactivation of the transmission of the oldest translation of the homilies from the 16th century onwards. And I was curious if you could perhaps say a little bit more about a specific context, perhaps in which people suddenly became interested in these homilies, how they were transmitted, why at this moment there was such a revival of this particular uh, work of Chrysostom. I'm not entirely sure about this text, but uh, it uh, happened also with other texts that at this time in Russia, it looks like there was some um, revival among some circles like the old believers, for example. So uh, there, uh, there were these uh, scriptoria that were very active in uh, providing older manuscripts and copying and distributing them. And usually we don't have the earlier, uh, well, the the sources, but these copies are uh, then preserved. And uh, sometimes the best we have are from uh, these centuries from, uh, well, in, in this case, 16th uh, century Russia, but we have also from 15th century also quite a lot of copies of texts that we don't have in earlier manuscripts. I think uh, part of uh, this tradition is uh, connected with the, the old believers. So this uh, 
sect or uh, heresy, some, some would say, others would say just uh, some part of Christianity that was a little bit more conservative. And they were interested in such texts. Thank you. It's interesting to hear a little bit more about this broader context. Yeah, thank you. The next question is uh, by Dam. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. A very, very interesting um, uh, material you're presenting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm curious what's going on with the situation that you described, where um, the two translations come to next to one another. What's with that correspondence? When does that happen? Mm -hmm. You mean, uh, how would would it be possible for the second translator to have the, the first one and work on it? And why would they choose to go in, in that manner? Mm -hmm. Or to keep the phrase? Yeah, uh, it's a difficult question, um, but it's not the only example here. So usually when uh, we look at the uh, South Slavic uh, tradition, of course, we can imagine a continuous uh, history of uh, translations and uh, writings from the 9th to the 15th, 16th century and so on. But uh, we can see that there are uh, a couple of periods that were especially active. The first one in the uh, 10th century and the second one, uh, 13th, 14th, uh, especially the 14th century. And uh, what happens in between, sometimes it's, it's not entirely clear. But uh, in the 14th century, uh, there was uh, some kind of a revision of uh, of the books uh, of older translations, some of them were translated anew, and I mean not only these Chrysostomian homilies, but a uh, much, much larger uh, body of, uh, of works. And um, they uh, were already, um, I mean, the older translations were in, in some way already obsolete, full of mistakes, full of archaic words, uncomprehensible, not suitable for the new uh, audience and so on. And one, one would say, why uh, making a revision if maybe it's easier to make a new translation without looking at the older one? But, uh, well, that was the case in, in many of these parts. So they were completely translated completely anew. So they had nothing in common with the older translations. But then there were these other parts that were absolutely identical, which means that uh, maybe there was a distribution of these older translation in on the Balkans and for sure uh, on Mount Athos. Uh, the monasteries had rich libraries and uh, monks, uh, communicated with each other so uh, they could uh, have access to these translations, which means that this monk had access to the translation but needed to make a new one. Uh, and as we can see, this new one was not very widely distributed. If we have only three copies, maybe there were some others, of course, but uh, not as many as uh, we could expect for such a text. But Mount Athos is a good place for older and newer texts to communicate and to meet. But when does one retranslate something without reformulating the, um, uh, the whole phrase? Keep, when does one keep the syntax? Is this one of those situations that I remember you showing into in the Leuven. Um... I wondered whether to show it now. <laughs> uh, I haven't prepared it, but I can try to uh, find it and show it. it uh, what I showed in Leuven was exactly the rework of exactly this particular text. So uh, oh, really? I... So I can, and if you look for the pictures, I'll describe briefly what I remember seeing in that picture for uh, the others in the room. Yeah, I, I can. I'm ready. So I, I, I found it, uh, and uh, I, I think I can show it briefly. Uh, I'll just share this time my entire screen. So yeah, here it is. 
I hope that you're seeing that. Mm -hmm. So the lower text is the Preslav translation of the homilies on the statues. Yeah. And the corrections, so to say, is this 17th century Russian translation. But I suppose that something similar happened in the 14th century. We and, just have this example. Yeah, sorry. And if you extract from these pages the Russian uh, translation, do you have the same thing that you showed us, like correspondence in phrase? Uh, in uh, well, in some, uh, I haven't seen more of these uh, pages because only this page is online and now it's a little bit difficult to get access to, to the rest of the manuscript. This is from the Russian uh, State Museum, so the, the manuscript is not online. But uh, the whole translation that is uh, the interlinear, so the new one, the new version, is uh, preserved also in clean copies that look like a different translation. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have this particular uh, particular one, this page here or this manuscript in particular, maybe we uh, would wonder again, is it a new translation or uh, is it just a revision? And we can see in the margins that uh, there are some notes uh, uh, in Greek, which means that the translator had access to Greek. And uh, some of the changes here are of uh, older words with newer ones, but the others are just synonyms. So I'm not sure how, uh, how important it was for them to make it uh, more relevant uh, and at each stage, at each uh, era, at each century, maybe, these were different, uh, I don't know, ideals. W what's a good translation? What's a good style? For example, this 14th century one, according to me, it's too literal, a little bit uh, in incomprehensible. If you don't know Greek, then it makes sometimes no sense. But um, yeah. Very interesting it, situation. Indeed. Andy wanted to, yes, to say I something. Was, yes, Andy, Andy, please. Hi, uh, thanks very much. Um, it's a great, great topic again for this kind of uh, for this kind of seminar. Um, I'm just curious about this, uh, this. So there's this one homily that is left out in the first translation, but it appears in the second one. It, mm -hmm. Have you been able to find out why that is? Is that because of its contents or is it just have you been able to track it down because of a Greek collection which doesn't have that either or is it uh, why 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 is, why is it absent and why was it added by the second one mm -hmm. yeah this is uh, homily 20 so uh, mm -hmm. in the in the greek uh, in the studies on the greek text um they deal uh, very often with the um consecutive order of the homilies how they were uh, pronounced at what time uh, in what order, how many of them were there, and how they were uh, edited, because this Patrologia Greca edition, uh, it is a reprint of, uh, as usual, of Montfaucon's edition, and Montfaucon used uh, previous editions, and uh, I don't know, maybe nine manuscripts or so. So really, uh, the way they are numbered in the edition, and this uh, homily number 20 is put there after number 90 and before 21, uh, this homily was not in this position in all the Greek manuscripts. So there were manuscripts that exclude this homily altogether, or it is somewhere apart or after the homilies and so on. So it's number 20 is not uh, entirely correct. And uh, in other manuscripts, this homily number 20 is somewhere, I think in our uh, uh, a, translation A, it is after uh, number 18. So number uh, after number 18, we have this uh, number 20 and then 19, 21 and so on. So, um, and, and there is one that is called 22, but it's not uh, a part of these. Uh, I mean, it is one of the homilies on the status. Anyway, we have such tradition. We have uh, in the uh, Greek manuscripts of both 
with or without this homily 20. And another important thing is that this homily 20 was a uh, part of other collections. So it had a, an early Slavonic translation that I haven't worked on yet, uh, but uh, it was part of the text for the Great Land, for example, because it discusses the Great Land and the end of the land uh, and uh, approaching um, resurrection and so on. So uh, for the earlier translation, it was not part of the Greek tradition, I think. And when the second translation was made, the Greek uh, sources already contained it. And the translator made a new translation of it. OK. Am I allowed to ask a second question? Something else, something, Absolutely. something completely different, Go ahead. which is just just how to place this in the in the in the larger reception history of of Chrysostom in Slavonic. Is this a typical case where we have a second translation, a new translation? Is mm. it, does it sometimes happen, or is it is it just uh, is it case on a case by case basis? It is a very typical case to have a second translation. Uh, sometimes a third translation or three translations and five uh, revisions or one translation and four revisions and things like that. But it is not a very typical case to have a translation of the whole thing, because usually in Slavonic, uh, when they translate Chrysostom, they choose, they select uh, homilies and they uh, compile collections according to their taste, uh, tastes, uh, their needs, maybe uh, about a topic or about uh, some uh, period of the year and so on. But uh, it is not very typical to have the whole, um, the whole series on the statues and translate it from the beginning to the end, uh, on the one hand. On the other, However, uh, especially in the earlier tradition, in the 10th century uh, Preslav tradition, uh, it looks like uh, uh, the Tsars, the, yeah, the, the Tsar Simeon and his son Peter wanted to have a good library. And there was this um, uh, strife for, um, for making translations of the church fathers in large volumes. And John Chrysostom was, of course, very important. So in one way, it was typical. In other ways, not so much. But it is very typical to have several translations of the same thing. So so why? Sorry, I'm just, just curious because it, why is this one then so why is this one then so popular specifically? Because it's such a because it's also so striking the difference in the reception in Syriac and, and Latin, where you just have one homily and here it's just the entire collection. What what is the specific interest in it? It is it is a very good text. It is a, these are very good homilies. Uh, I mean, I also wondered because they are about Antioch and they uh, describe Antioch. So they describe some streets and some uh, places that were uh, that our I, I mean I don't know peasants in the Slavonic word uh, world have uh, never seen never heard of. But on the other hand, uh, it is also very uh, instructive. So in a way, these homilies are really uh, good preaching. And I think it was connected also with that. It's a good preaching material. Um, but I, I don't know who read that, really. No idea. Who was the the audience for such a text? Some learned people, maybe, not the general public. I think hmm. so because I doubt that they yeah. were pronounced in in church. I don't think so. Okay. I think they were so, read. So, so it's the rhetorical aspect that is very much at the heart. I of think it. so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. There also is a question um, by Margaret in the chat. Margaret, would you like to um, ask it yourself? Mm, yeah, I, I see. Uh, or I could read it as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about it's about ubiquity in the linear um, translation. The image that you showed is how different is the language itself between the 14th century and the new uh, translation? I don't think it's very different. 
um, it's a little bit different, but um, no, maybe I, I'm not correct. Uh, well, uh, I'm thinking about two things. It is different in a way, uh, because really the language of the 10th century translation is already archaic for the 14th century and what to say about 16th, 17th, of course. Uh, and some words were uh, too uh, marginal, I would say, maybe too regional, um, and they had to be replaced. These were, these were the words that uh, we have a list of that show us that it was a translation from the 10th century Preslav and not from somewhere else. But on the other hand, uh, the people who made these translations, who copied, who uh, read and listened and so on, they were uh, educated. And as always, the written tradition is much more conservative than the oral one. So they were familiar with the language, even if it was different from the spoken language. So, of course, uh, it needed some uh, adaptation, but uh, I don't think that all the replacements were because of uh, unintelligibility, if there is such a word. Yeah, I think they understood, but maybe some words needed more uh, uh, more uh, revision than others. Some replacements don't make sense to me because they uh, say basically the same thing, but others maybe were needed. But it's still the same language in development, so to say. Very interesting, thank you. Um, and if there are no further questions, I propose that we here thank Agneta for this wonderful presentation showing us the pathways of the translation. And I'm also sure that there are many more discoveries uh, to come. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all ah. for joining. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I see that uh, oh. Marius asked about oh, yes. the, the syntax, but yeah, yeah, it's, I think we can go on and on, but yeah, the mm. syntax is uh similar let's say okay thank you thank you so much for the interest and for the invitation thank you very yeah. much thank very you. good seeing thank you everyone thank you bye to Have everyone day, yeah. good thank day. you goodbye all the best <clears throat> thanks everyone have a nice day